Coming up on the next episode of Painting and Travel, Roger and Sarah Batsimer join artist David Darrow as they paint and visit one of the many renowned galleries of colorful Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm here with my friend David Darrow, who is primarily a portrait artist from California, but we've met here in Santa Fe, and we're out at this beautiful landscape location where I've got some mountains in the background, wildflowers, and a ravine over here to our left. David has agreed to paint with me this morning, and it's a real joy because I most often paint alone, so it'll be fun to paint with a friend. So thanks for coming out, David. It's a delight to be here. It is, isn't it? It's just such a beautiful day. It is gorgeous. I know you do portraits primarily, so what do you what do you feel is a relationship between, as far as painting goes, between portraits and a landscape here? Because they are really totally different, or are they? Well, certainly painting a portrait is going to be different from painting a landscape. The first thing that comes to mind is that you don't really have to get a likeness. Uh, <laughs> There's nobody, nobody's going to come by and say, that doesn't look like that ravine, you know, unless I really mess it up. <laughs> but beyond that, I mean, there's a lot of room for interpretation when you're painting a landscape. You can move this or that or uh, remove something that you don't like in the picture. That's a really good point. You know, I, I never thought of it quite that way. So in some ways, I think painting uh, portraits in some ways are more limiting than painting a landscape, aren't they? Yeah, especially with that in mind. You know, I should mention before I go any further, uh, I'm using acrylics today and David is using oils. I've got a very limited palette. David's got uh, quite a few more different colors out on his palette here. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, uh, Prussian blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, alizarin crimson, and naphthol red. So I have, uh, as uh, I do often, a very limited palette, but I have a cool and a warm blue, cool in a warm yellow, cool in a warm red. So I can generally mix all the colors I need with these three primary colors, each one being either warm or cool. So I'm trying to block in these big shapes to begin with. David got a little earlier start than I did. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I generally start out painting my dark colors first and starting using my transparent colors first. Is that generally what you do as well? Uh, yes. Everything is a relationship, isn't it? Because you can say this is a cool color, but you have to say that only when compared to something else on your canvas. Exactly. It's really just what's next to it. Is it cooler or warmer than that? Mm -hmm. Or is it more neutral? And of course, the first part of the painting here, it either makes or breaks the painting, doesn't it? If I don't get a good composition... Yeah, that's where all the composition lies. Exactly. Then uh, no matter how many details I put in the painting, it can't cover up a bad composition with a lot of good details, can you? No. It's like getting a good likeness and having the person's face halfway off the canvas. <laughs> this is just Prussian blue. Maybe it's thalo blue, I'm not sure. It's pretty much the same color. Do you go for your lightest light right away? Uh, no, I, well, I put my darkest darks in first. Okay. Then I put my middle tones, and then my lightest lights. I like to cover my whole canvas, if, because if I don't cover it all, then my relationships, even if I think they're right, once I put the sky in, it throws all the relationships to a different level or a different position. Do you think you consciously put in uh, darks in your background that you know are going to be lighter eventually? Oh, yeah, definitely. I. I always 
I always paint darker than I know it's going to end up. That's handy information. Well, and one reason is, for me personally, David, is because if I look at these weeds here, the darkest part of the, the weed or the bush, whatever it is, is sort of inside the bush. It's, in, it's almost like it's the background of the bush I'm painting. Same way with a tree. I, all the interior parts of the tree are dark and they're in shadow. So I put those dark and then I can work out and paint the, uh, the lighter highlights. It just seems for me it's sort of a natural progression. Would that uh, apply even to something like a, a mountain that is a fairly unvaried set of hues and values? Do you find yourself lightening your mountains as you No, that's a, good, that's a good point. No, I would probably try and hit those on the mark the first okay. time. It's, pri it's mostly the foreground that I would uh, make much darker. That, I like that. That's a good point. It's mostly the foreground I'd make much darker because obviously I wouldn't make the sky much darker uh, than I intend to have it ended up as. Do you ever use black in your portraits? I don't use it for uh, I don't use it for a color or for shadows. Certainly not. Right. I might use it to, uh, I definitely use it to darken things or to put down, If uh, let's say the, the person I'm painting is wearing a black garment. I know it's going to be very dark by the time I'm done, but I'm still going to try and control the color of that black because it's going to be a different color black in the shadow than in the highlight. Yes. So I don't use black to paint black. Exactly, that's exactly I, how I do, okay. On the rare occasions that I use black, I, I prefer to mix my own. Even if a person's wearing a black garment, I'll mix it from ultramarine blue and um, brown and alizarin crimson and mm -hmm. kind of swing it the direction I want it to go. Uh, I use black primarily to dull my colors, to make them grayer but not darker. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I was taught in art school never to use black. It was just forbidden. I got that too. <laughs> but. Um, but I changed my mind on that uh, recently, and I just figure it's just just another tool, and if it can work to my benefit, uh, I don't want to limit myself in any way, especially by something I was taught uh, 40 years ago. David and I are going to take a short break from painting and join Sarah at Gallery Row here in Santa Fe. The galleries in Santa Fe are truly fabulous with some of the best artwork in the entire West. The heart of the gallery district is Canyon Road, where there are almost a hundred galleries featuring paintings and sculptures of Native American art, early 20th century art, traditional and contemporary art, and of course a huge selection of Southwestern art. We're in the Alterman Gallery, and this is Richard Alterman. This is a family business that's been going for a while, and I'd love to hear about it. Sure. Uh, we're located at 225 Canyon Road. Uh, we've been in business since 1978. Uh, some of the paintings in my office, uh, one is a Charles Russell painting that was executed in 1899, and he was one of the first artists who portrayed the American West, and most of the collectors who appreciated his art at that time were from uh, back east. At that time, uh, the West was not known, and the, the romance that was associated with it was appreciated by people because they'd never traveled west. It wasn't until the railroad uh, started working its way west that the Easterners actually came out and saw firsthand what was being portrayed in his paintings by Russell. And to this day, uh, uh, we call them contemporary, uh, Western art collectors uh, also have that same sensibility and appreciation for uh, fine Western art. Is it watercolor? It is a watercolor, and the artist was well known for uh, executing watercolors as well as oil paintings. And how would this painting get back to the East? Well, uh, there would be galleries in uh, Manhattan and New York City that promoted these artists. Uh, Charles Russell. He worked on a uh, Montana ranch, and he was married uh, to uh, someone who had a very sharp uh, business acumen and would take his works of art back east where they were shown there. Uh, so his patronage at that time was coming out of New York City. I see. So this probably traveled by train? Uh, probably so. Or stagecoach or our wagon. Or a combination. Yeah, they're up. Mm -hmm. Well, that adds to the richness and the history. And you have some other special mm -hmm. pieces I'd like to hear about, too. Uh, to our right on the wall is a painting by uh, Ernest uh, Martin Hennings, and he was a member of the Tau Society of Artists. 
and the, this piece was probably completed uh, during the 1920s. Do you have any interesting uh, portraits here? Uh, some of the portraits in my office that are uh, very uh, powerful, in my opinion, would be this piece uh, by Joseph Henry Sharp, who is also a member of the Tile Society of Artists. Here in the Alterman Galleries, in addition to the work on display year-round, there are three auctions held each year, offering artwork by notable artists such as Thomas Hart Benton, Frederick Remington, Charles Russell, whom we saw earlier, and many others. The variety, the quality, and styles of work in this and the numerous other galleries in Santa Fe are an inspiration to the visitors, the collectors, and the artists seeking a visual garden of delights. This is such a beautiful scene here, these purple flowers. I'm trying to bring a little bit of this warm purplish color down into my landscape. Uh, when I look at a, a good painting, and there are so many good paintings here in Santa Fe, yeah. I often notice when looking at a nice painting that it has an overall tone to it. I can look at the painting and say, this is a green painting, a yellow painting, a yellow ochre painting, a blue painting. And uh, I think that's one mark of a good painter. You can look at their, their artwork, uh, at least in the traditional style of painting, and you can find a local color in it. I mean, you get a sense of the whole key of the entire painting, is yes. that what you're saying? Yeah. I find that often I mix a color on my palette that I think is just right, and I put it on my painting, and I think, oh, it's not purple enough, or it's not green enough. Mm -hmm. That's one... Uh, reason I like to have my palette very close to my painting because when I mix it I can look over at my painting at the same time and better uh, gauge whether it's the right color and value or not. Well that's a cool setup you got there. I can see how that works for you. See I'm trying to mix this green up here now and since it's so close I can tell whether I need to warm it up or cool it down. I don't use much palette space. I tend to uh, use it. Just mix everything right in the same area? Mix everything right in the same area. I'm not sure why. I do know that uh, in using acrylics, it's different than using oils. If I were to do this with oils, I would probably get a big muddy pile there pretty quickly. Making use of the colors you've already put down? I'm making use of, yes, which helps me uh, maintain a little bit of harmony just by mere accident. Yeah. Well, since I put some of these warm colors down here in this foreground, now I'm putting some of the greens over that, and it's allowing some of that warmth to show through my, my board. This is a masonite board, by the way, just primed with gesso. I'm going to attempt to put in this ravine now. I may have to lose some of these flowers, but of course, using acrylics, see, this is all dry right now. Or pretty dry. I could maybe spray it and bring it back to life a little bit, but... This is dry enough where I can paint over this and not have these, these warm colors of the ravine mix in with this. We have to describe this more because right now it, this could be a path, it could be some kind of a road or anything. So I'll need to define this a little bit better. And before I leave, I'll take some photographs of this so I'll be able to finish it in the studio with some reference photos. I very seldom finish a painting out on location. There are many artists uh, that go out in the field and will do a painting like this and they'll call it a study and uh, take it back into their studio and do a larger painting from a smaller painting like this. I have never been successful in doing that and I admire the artists that can, but to me this painting that I bring back into the studio will not have enough information for me to create a bigger painting. It would have enough information for me to create a smaller painting, but not one larger. What about uh, combining the study, which has the much more accurate color and your color decisions, with the, with the detail of the photo that you take as a backup? Well, 
Can, yes. you, can you then do a b much bigger one? With... Yeah, then I, then I could. Mm. Okay. And so do you think that those artists that go out and do studies are excluding photography from their assistants? That's a good point. You know what? I, I, I know I, they don't talk about it. because They I... don't talk about it, but <laughs> I'll bet you've, you, you're, you're right. I'm sure they use photographs, too. If they didn't, they're missing out on tools that are, are very useful. I think the same goes for uh, projecting an image. No artist wants to admit he's ever projected an image. I've never projected an image in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I have, and uh, right, I've I talked have. about it. And uh, I don't think that's anything to be uh, embarrassed about either. Or, no, it's a valuable tool. It's a valuable tool, sure. There's no substitute for drawing. I agree. But there's nothing faster than just being able to get your outlines done real quick and get the proportions right. Well, yes. And then you can concentrate on other important things. How's your painting coming, David? Uh, horrible. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I can fix it. That's, that's true. I often feel like, oh, what have I done here? <laughs> but persistence has a lot to do with being a painter, doesn't it? I talk to a lot of artists that have a habit of just throwing a painting away when it's not going well. Mm -hmm. And I've always been the kind of person to set it aside for another day when I feel like I can fix it. I don't throw a lot of work away. I don't either, but I don't set paintings aside. Uh, if I do, I, I lose interest in them, and I don't tend to go back to them. I never said I'd difficult. come back to them. <laughs> I just say I set them aside with the intention of coming back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going, I've got these trees up here. I need to address some negative areas in the trees. The edge of the form will describe what the object is. And if I were to just take this part of the painting without showing the sky, it would not describe a tree at all. It would just be a bunch of dull colors. So what describes this tree is the edge of the form. That's kind of evidence at uh, theme parks we've all been to where someone sits and cu cuts out a, a silhouette with black paper. Uh, of course, there's, there's no detail within that black paper, but you can tell who it is just by the edge of the form. And that's the same thing with really any object. The description of the object lies at the edge of the form. Well, these negative areas here are really helping out the description of this tree. I'm putting in more negative areas than I actually see up there, but I'm trying to put in enough or a sufficient amount to describe the uh, sky behind the tree and really define some of these branches. As I look at my piece right now, I see that this area up here and this area down here are not only the same value, but the same intensity. So I have to work on that and change it, but I don't want to go too recklessly. I always squint my eyes, as I'm sure you do, David, yeah. because that helps me eliminate details from uh, my vision and let, it lets me see the big picture of things. Squinting for me uh, is for exactly the same reason and also it helps me determine what dark versus light. I can find the light and dark patterns better. Mm -hmm. As I'm doing this landscape, I, there's some bushes that are naturally growing over here, but I'm taking advantage of these because everything right now might just sort of run off the edge of the board. This tree here puts a, a border or a sort of a stopping point for the eye on this painting. So I like how I'm glad that tree was there. I may have put it there even if it wasn't because this keeps my attention in the area of interest here and doesn't let it just fall off the edge. So this tree is a good uh, compositional thing to have in this painting. I'm going to put in a few more darks. I've taken out the darks and I'm going to put a few more in. Painting is always a back and forth situation, isn't it? I find the same thing in portraiture. Put something down and 
to try and reinforce another area and then that's too much and so you go paint the other area it's always, <laughs> sometimes it's like trying to even up your sideburns you know <laughs> pretty soon you're halfway up your head <laughs> I don't know about you David but even if I don't end up with a good painting here and my better paintings are done in the studio not out on location I learn more by being out here I really do absolutely but uh, it's just a really nice experience, isn't it? Just oh, sitting absolutely. here. absolutely, yeah. When I paint flowers or any small little object like this that's in a cluster, I try my best to use brush strokes and not do this thing that just dab with the brush. You know, this is sort of the easy way out to dab these flowers in like this. And it does work. It's a technique. It, it is a technique, and it does work, but... So what do you do that differs from that? Well, I, and I do some of this because you, you almost have to, but I don't. I try not to rely on it too much because it becomes too much of an obvious technique, and... Then the painting's up about technique instead of what you saw, huh? Yes, and I think a lot of what makes a good painting is the artist's brush strokes. They are what the, that's the artist's language. And it can describe the, how the artist feels about subjects and objects. And if you do too much of this dabbing, uh, you, lose the, you lose that identity. I feel the same way about blending something out too much. Yes. As far as blending goes, if I have, if there are two colors together, a uh, light green and a dark green, rather than blending them together, I'll mix up an inter intermediate green and put that in as a brush stroke. Yeah. And that way I can maintain my, my, uh, my feeling so, so the artist, so the viewer can see the brush strokes and I don't lose those. Uh, it almost loses the message when all those are blended. It makes it less painterly anyway. I think if I were to take a big brush and dab all these trees and that sort of thing in, I would have been with, done with this painting a long time ago uh, and, and may have had a more uh, convincing appeal to, to many people, but you know, I just like the idea of having myself on this canvas and not just a uh, a picture. A picture with a <laughs> convincing technique. And I've spent the last decade of my life trying trying to paint less realistically and more uh, brushstrokey, painterly. See if I can communicate the same information with much more variety. I often like to put in a highlight somewhere in my painting, even though we're in bright sunlight now. We've been lucky with this. We haven't had the light change on us hardly at all because there's no clouds in the sky. Uh, but I might like to add a patch of sunlight somewhere in this painting. I may consider doing that either here or most likely back in the studio, or maybe not at all. Those are often the three choices that confront you <laughs> out here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's really coming out beautiful, Roger. Well, thanks. These flowers in the distance, as they recede from me, they certainly lose their detail, so I'm going to just put a suggestion of those in with the some broad vertical strokes. I'm going to push the color a little bit on these trees back here. May or may not work. This is all about trial and error. Mostly error. <laughs> it's true. That's <laughs> it's the way true. I look at it too. I tell people that my paintings are an extended series of corrections. 
I'm trying to lighten these trees just enough where it doesn't become too much of a patchwork quilt. If I lighten these too much, I'll lose the big shape on it. It uh, sort of goes back to adding too much detail. But I don't want to lose this, the big mass back here. Well, the sun has changed a little bit. We've been lucky with the sunlight and the weather here. It's been a beautiful place to paint. I'm ready to quit on mine and finish it back in the studio. How about you, David? I think this is a great stopping point. Okay, well, uh, before we go, I'm going to take some reference photos. Uh, and then we'll bring this back to the studio. I'll uh, work on it some more, sign it, put some varnish on it, a frame on it, and uh, we'll see what it looks like. Yeah, this has been great. Yeah, thanks for coming out, David. Nice it's to really do it. Great. Here we are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm here with Start my friend. Start over, I wasn't looking at the camera. I brought along some tunes for us to dance to if you feel like <laughs> taking a break here. <laughs> Fortunately, it's just my wife. It wasn't important. <laughs> That's a joke. You can scratch that whole sentence because it didn't make a darn bit of sense. <laughs> but, be sure and quote me. <laughs> That's nice. Did you just break your brush? Just broke my brush. Just get a new brush and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.